Hi guys, welcome back to another video slash podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. You might be watching us on YouTube, you might be listening to us on Spotify, and you might also be listening to us on Apple Podcasts. Thanks so much to all of you that have tuned in, but also written reviews on Apple Podcasts. We do really appreciate it. Thanks so much for everyone who's downloaded podcasts on Spotify, and we've just had some really kind words about what we're doing. So we do really appreciate it. We've got some awesome things lined up, and we hope you're as excited as we are. As always, I'm joined by my very good friend, Scott Sharp. How are you doing, buddy? Yeah, hey, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, man. How um, Yeah, how are you well, getting on? Uh, yeah, mate, all right. Uh, how good is it now to go out with other people <laughs> instead of just yeah. on your own? <laughs> Yeah, literally so good, man. I went swimming the other day with, well, with Sam, who we're getting on the podcast now. And um, yeah, it was it was so nice. Uh, mate, I think this week's been ledjo with the amount of comments we've got and like positivity. Yeah. Although, who dislikes on YouTube? Yeah. Why is that even fun? <laughs> mate, I swear it's probably someone I know who's just trying to wind me up because I get a dislike after about five minutes of posting any video. And it's probably the same, <laughs> the same bastard every time. It's gonna be your mum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I bet it is. I'll be having words. <laughs> mum, if you're watching this, just stop it, all right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, um, but yeah, like class, like the comments we receive are absolutely unbelievable. Um, yeah, and the amount really of good. Instagram as well as as well as even like on the re- actual reviews itself like everyone's yeah. sharing it on the, on their social medias keep keep doing it if we keep doing yeah. well um but yeah absolutely class. yeah yeah and just really excited to keep it going as well like we've got some really cool ideas and over the next few weeks we'll hopefully be posting about those and getting some hype up for what we're doing because yeah we've got some cool things tonight hopefully um, you will really enjoy this podcast because we are interviewing Sam Pictor, very good friend of mine, very good athlete, and we will be linking up with his audio right now. So just before we actually get going, I know we, we've we already done the intro. You will notice that I've changed my earphones. <laughs> um, oh, this has been such a piss take, but we finally got here. Hopefully our audio is all sounding okay. And we're going to wel- welcome Sam to the podcast. How are you doing, mate? Very good, thank you. It's good to be here. I'm sorry for the uh, nice. technical issues earlier. I don't like technology <laughs> at the best of times. So. Right, I yeah, that just um, that was <laughs> we're weird. There, we're there now. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> hopefully, it sounds all right. The thing is, Sam, it wasn't even you. It was the bloke with the 150 quid <laughs> microphone, <laughs> with headphones. <laughs> <laughs> Too clever for his own good. <laughs> wait i just i should just let you guys chat and i should bugger off <laughs> we hear no idea sounds familiar <laughs> you're a dick <laughs> <laughs> uh so sam for the viewers that maybe don't know much about you um do you want to just give like a brief um intro into like who you are what you do yeah absolutely so my name is sam Pictor. Um, I'm, well, I guess I'm a 70.3 professional triathlete. Uh, so I race middle distance and I have raced for Lionman. Been racing professional for the last two years, um, give or take. And yeah, based in Bristol. Uh, so get to train with Harry a bit as well as a group of athletes around here. Um, yeah, that's it. I, I, I guess nice. I work um i work three days three or four days a week um and so that's like a key balance i've got at the moment um with yeah work and, and racing but um yeah yeah i think that's definitely something that we'll, we'll touch on is like how you as a professional athlete you figure out how to kind of structure your work around your training around your family life as well yeah in terms of family life at the moment it's um yeah my, me and my wife claire um who's pregnant with our baby yeah Due, our first child due in September, and then we've got a one and a half year old um, Hungarian Vizsla, which is nice yeah, and keeps us, yeah, keeps our hands full. Keeps you on your toes. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. A good baby practice, I think. Yeah, yeah. mate, one hundred percent. I think it's harder than a baby. But whenever I tell people that, yeah. they just look at me and smile. <laughs> mate, I've I've got a 
yeah, we've got a 13-year-old Hungarian Vizsla and she's still batshit crazy. <laughs> yeah, okay then. So, um, yeah, I've been looking forward to Tilly growing out of her puppy years, but... Um, my oh, she won't, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't get easier. <laughs> um, so what I would say is links to Sam's um, social media and everything will be in the description below. So go check him out, give him a follow, and also his Instagram will be on the screen if you're watching us on youtube it'll be on the screen now so yeah go and give him a follow do some really cool stuff um uh so scott do you want to kick us off with a couple of questions for sam uh sam yeah my first question uh you mentioned in your little intro then that you're a pro triathlete uh but you still work uh yeah. <laughs> thought you were a pro yeah that's um that's a good question. I think that's probably the case for a lot of um, professional triathletes. Um, like I'm a pro triathlete in the sense that I've got my professional license. Um, I race in the pro field, um, but I and I do win prize money and I get a bit of money through sponsorship. But I don't earn enough to pay the mortgage, um, and so I'm a professional triathlete. I race with the pros um, and. I I get some good results, but I'm not good enough, I guess, to pay pay all the bills and support myself and my wife um, financially. Yeah. So it's a bit of a balance and too. Scott, I will just sorry, I'm just going to butt in here. Um, Sam, that's definitely something that people when you say I'm a professional athlete, I'm a professional triathlete, they just immediately assume that you're making loads of money from the sport, don't they? Yeah, they do, and I I mean I get. Yeah, I've, it surprises me, but I get messages from people asking for like free stuff and like, can I give them my old bike and things like that? And they just have no idea. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't actually own my bike. Like, my sponsors let me ride it for the season and then I give it back. Like, it's not, I'm not like, that's the thing. Like, with, with triathlon, people are, people don't necessarily realize that like, unless you're right at the top, like you're Jan Frodeno or Daniela Reef or whatever, it's very, it's very hard to make a living from it, isn't it? Yeah. That is it is uh, yeah and you need consistent results and the season is getting longer but there's still not like you're trying to earn enough money in the summer and like the spring and then you push it out into the autumn to then pay you through the winter and yeah it's just not um it's it's a it's a process and like you make progress yeah. and definitely as you build like as you build consistent results and build good relationships with sponsors um, and with race organizers, you then start to get more support. And, but that takes time. And unless you're like yeah, someone like Lucy Charles, that's come into the sport and is obviously performing at the highest level, like you're not going to get that stuff overnight. Um, yeah. 100%. And, yeah, so it does take time, but yeah, that's what, so when people ask like in normal conversation, like, Oh, what do you do for a living? It's quite a hard question to answer because I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I generally go with, yeah, I do, um, I do finance and, um, and like part time finance, part time triathlon. They're like, well, what does that mean? Yeah. I'm, like, I'm not really sure. Yeah. But it seems, it's good fun. So I, I just dabble a little bit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, just a bit, a bit of both. Yeah. And then in a bit of this mind, and a bit of that. In people's minds, you're like, you're working two and a half days doing like finance and then you're just doing two and a half days triathlon. But actually, it's more like. <laughs> triathlons all consuming like every morning every lunchtime every afternoon evening um so for, yeah. as you know harry it's like yeah it's 25 hours even for if long isn't it yeah even if it's 20 hours of training time it's it's or 25 hours like not that i i rarely hit that but like say i'm hitting 20 hours training time i worked out there's at least 10 hours of admin like traveling to and from oh yeah showering like pre pre session prep post session prep um it's at least 30 35 hours if not more depending on like yeah. how your how your like training structured so in i work a lot harder for the money that i earn through triathlon <laughs> <laughs> yeah 100 percent. i saw someone the other day and they were reading a book whilst on the bike now i can't do that but Sam, you 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 might be able to if you're an accountant or if you work in finance, because then people are quite clever. Have you not thought about just getting your laptop out on the bike? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I, get, I have Zwift going, that's for sure. But trying to combine the two literally uh, would not go well for, <laughs> for for either me on the bike or or my um, financial work. Yeah, no, I'm not sure about that one. 
You've been doing quite a lot of races on Zwift lately, haven't you? Yeah, it's been, uh, I mean, I think everyone has, like lockdown has changed things. And I'd say, interestingly, before lockdown, like, I I love racing, but I get so nervous before racing. And although that has improved over the last like year or two, but I used to say that actually I'd, if someone would pay me just to train all the time and not race, like I'd take that because I love the training. I love swim, bike, run. Um, the racing's like stressful. It's a, a pro level as well, you're like, you're constantly weighing it up. So you're thinking, okay, I've spent this much on flights, this much on like, accommodation. Therefore, I've got to finish at least like fifth or sixth or whatever it is to actually break even, let alone make money. So you've got like pressure mm-hmm. from that. Um, but then interestingly, now that the racing's been taken away, I realize that so much of my motivation does come from racing. And so Zwift has been so good for that to like really like test and sharpen yourself like midweek. And you can just do it like you can with a baby on the way. I think it's going to be a lot more Zwift racing for me because I can just jump on the turbo race like full on for 30, 40 minutes and then get off and crack on with like normal life and helping Claire out. Um, So yeah, Zwift racing is good. Like you do push yourself Um, even though there's no money on the line. It's um, yeah, it's good to like bury yourself on like a Wednesday evening. Yeah, really interesting to see that, um, that market like develop and, and people's interaction with it. And I think it will last way beyond lockdown. Like you can see it today. Like there was, it's one of the best days of the year, like sun shining, 20 degrees, and um, still loads of people on Zwift, even though they're allowed outside, just because you become addicted to it. And um, I think triathletes naturally have a bit of an addictive personality. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I think, um, I think it's actually, it's opened people's eyes, hasn't it, to the fact that you can pretty much do all your training inside if you're forced to be inside you can do it so i think suddenly people will now think about oh do i want to go outside or do i just want to stay inside because it's easy yeah i mean depending where you live like especially if you're in a city like you get a lot more bang for your buck you've not got that time getting in and out of the city stopping at lights getting stuck behind traffic uh, I definitely like look to Lionel Sanders and I think a lot of those people do as a classic example of someone that does all their training inside and think like how on earth do you do that but actually lockdown yeah. shown it is quite possible and Zwift and having loads of people yeah. on Zwift having Zwift races has brought that, that interactions just made it um, made it so much more manageable like we did um, I think pre covid i think my longest ride indoors was three three and a half hours and it was an absolute battle just to stay on for that long and now i'm like knocking out four or five hour rides we did like an everest challenge over like 10 11 hours the other day and it wasn't that hard like (laughs) it's not something in a non-showy offy way it wasn't like mentally that challenging on a trainer which half a year ago or four months ago i probably would have like just would not have done it like you probably would have gone oh bugger that <laughs> yeah I, absolutely there's no way i would have done it and now it's actually like it's a good thing to tick off it's quite I found it quite fun like it's a bit dull mm. but it wasn't like it wasn't that bad it just yeah it's a weird one i think it shows you how much capacity people have like mentally once once that decision is taken away because i think half the battle is oh i could be riding outside and you sort of even when it's tipping down with rain you're like should i just go outside but once that decision is mm. taken out of your hands and you have to ride inside, it's like, oh, crack on. Like, It's just a new challenge yeah. that you've got to apply yourself to. Yeah, 100%. Put on our comments that um, they're, they're on Zwift whilst listening to this and you two have just spoke for a good two or three minutes about how easy it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think... <laughs> When I say when I say easy, I mean mentally sitting on the trainer. <laughs> There's nothing easy about Zwift, like as in you can do an easy ride, yeah, but like you can push yourself. I find on the trainer so much more than I could push myself out on the road. Um, just mm-hmm. the intensity you can achieve is so much higher. I'd be a bit scared to ride that hard on the road. I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but uh, so. Oh yeah, go on, Scott. I I go on. I'm chatting off. All right. Yeah. (laughs) No, that's what this podcast is all about. Literally, just chatting shit. (laughs) Um. So, 
originally, Sam, you were based down in Plymouth, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, so we... Um, yeah, go on. Was that the question? Uh, yeah, so... Uh, yes, yeah, so, sorry, that was, that was a shit question. <laughs> um, uh, so, <laughs> clearly not very good at this. Um, so you were based in Plymouth. Scott was actually based down in Plymouth as well. Um, what would you say, like... What was kind of like the difference between the triathlon scenes from Plymouth and Bristol? Like, what were the good things about Plymouth? What were the bad things about it? How was, how does it compare to to being in Bristol now? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think to give some context to that, I so I I studied um, geography up in Birmingham for three years and loosely did. I was part of the triathlon club, um, but did it like a couple of triathlons. Um, swam like probably maybe 15 times <laughs> over three years um <laughs> like i wouldn't really have called myself a triathlete but it was good fun um and that's probably the first time it entered my conscience uh, and then i were and i worked in london for three years um and then had two years in plymouth uh or no one one yeah a couple of years in plymouth and then um and now i'm in bristol but in in plymouth i wasn't i was a triathlete but i wasn't connected to the triathlon community i wasn't um training anywhere near the level i am now and it was a very different in plymouth i was sort of thinking about racing triathlon I'd, I'd done some duathlons while i was up in london um and my training did it was i'd cycle to work and back and then i'd go up on dartmoor on the way to work or go running like to work and back and probably swim at the life center like a couple of times so i didn't I couldn't comment on the triathlon community in Plymouth. Having now left Plymouth, like I was stuck in with a great running group down there. And I know like, I know you guys were down there. It's unfortunate we didn't sort of overlap it and, and get stuck in because it would have been great to train together. Um, mm. I know there's some good triathletes down there um, and there's some great triathletes in the area. You sort of got Donald Brooks and Henry over in, um, over sort of on the, southeast coast like torbay way and um yeah there's there's just people over the place some great guys down in cornwall as well and there is a good community down there training there i, I was talking with claire my wife yesterday and we were just like it would have been so good to be in lockdown down in plymouth like now <laughs> just swim in the sea like just off the hoe we used to live just off the hoe and you've got we could get back from work and we'd stick our wetsuits on, walk over the grass and then jump in the water, swim for as long as we want. You just get back from work and you could just go out, swim out and just float by the, like out by the boys, just chatting, which is like so, so nice. nice. It's so good. And I, I wouldn't say we took it for granted. Like we knew how good it was. Um, and like my runs to work were up the estuary and like training was so easy there. Um, you've got Dartmoor mm. on your doorstep. Um, I'd love, like, if it would be possible, I would love to go back down there at some point. I don't, I don't know if we will. Uh, Bristol, the southwest, generally, we've got some great facilities here. I've managed to get stuck in with a great training group in Bristol. Um, some great guys that push me, like, in the water, on, on the run and on the bike, um, as well as just having like good facilities. Uh, and there is open. There's there's quite a good array of open water facilities. It's not as good as Plymouth, where you're just swimming in like the the sea. But um, mm. yeah, there's some good facilities here. There's some incredible routes, like some great riding, um, potentially better than than Plymouth because with Plymouth, obviously you're limited to you can only go north, whereas because you yeah. can't see to the south. <laughs> but Bristol, <laughs> you've got you've got like Wales, um, you've got the Cotswolds, you've got uh, the Mendips, um, like yeah, and there's some incredible lanes and stuff on doorstep as well as like. Bad yeah. try and other other triathlon like clubs. And... Moving back from um, moving back down to Plymouth. Uh, like I know you you trained with someone called Graham Riley. Yeah. Uh, and, like I I approached Graham. I think you would just left for Bristol at the time, uh, and he went on to say how much of a shit hot runner you were. Um, and we spoke about it a little bit in our podcast last week, and you've kind of gone into it a little bit. Then is you weren't really in the triathlon community, but. You always ran with runners such as Mike Willsmore, probably is going to be the biggest name. And I know there were, were other absolute yeah. class athletes down there, but you ran with runners and you kind of just swam and cycled 
to I say to work, so you didn't swim to work, um, but you kind of just enjoyed it, didn't you? As, yeah. as, was it your age group at the time, or were you just enjoying triathlon? Just I wouldn't. I wasn't even an age group. But I didn't really know about the setup. Like I, I did. Um, yeah, Graham Riley, what a legend! Like just one of those guys that just puts himself out there and helps. Like it doesn't doesn't pay. Like you don't. Yeah just gives his time volunteers it and there's many there's many people like that across the country but it's people like graham that just like hold a group together and put plans and it just there's just the pureness of it like it's just a group of guys that turn up and just run hard um like yeah around the track and i love that and i just i i, I think i ran the plymouth half marathon um one year and then at the end one of the guys i was racing against was like oh, are you stuck in with a group here i was like no and you've just got here um and he pointed me in graham's direction and and through that i sort of got to run with mike who's like he's a he's got his england vest sort of running 1500 meters and the mile um like he's a class runner um and it's just great fun to like it's it's really good fun to have guys that can whip your ass like that you're not just going to be like leading the group um you want guys that are going to like put it to you and if you're not at 100 percent or if you're fit, not feeling it, like they're gonna make you like pay for it, and you'll be chasing, chasing their heels. <laughs> so that was like a really good position to be in. Um, and I was, I wasn't training for anything like in particular. I was just loving like running with them and getting quicker. And then I'd like think oh, I'll, I'll sign up for a, like do Plymouth half marathon again, or do like the ten k or something like that. Um, and then I sort of started to think about triathlon a bit more. I'd, I'd done a bit of age group duathlon. Um, prior to Plymouth and um yeah that just sort of thought I'll give yeah I think I just started to develop my training a bit more in the triathlon area but it was yeah it was for the love of it it's I think it was I love running and like running is probably my strongest out of the three but um I also just like the variety that you get with triathlon and so I think I ended up pursuing that rather than just running because I love riding my bike. I love being able to go up on, I love being able to go up onto Dartmoor and just the stuff you can see on like a long ride. You can just cover massive parts of the country. Um, done some incredible bike adventures, like bike touring through like the Alps and Pyrenees and all that sort of stuff. And, and then swimming, like I love surfing. I love just being in the water. So at the moment we're swimming over at Clevedon Marine Lake, which is half an hour from my door um, on the edge of Bristol. And it's just so nice to just be back in like fresh water or it's salt water, but it's, um, yeah, just, I think you sounds a bit earthy, but like you can connect with nature when you're like surfing and, and swimming in open water, um, in like such a good way. So yeah, it's definitely for the love of it. Such a geographer. Such a geographer. <laughs> I know Plymouth is just the dream for geography. <laughs> Uh, Sam, when when was your first triathlon? Slash, slash duathlon then. I find yeah. duathlon hard. It's actually interesting to speak about that as well. Yeah, duathlon is harder. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I did the the weird thing. I think this is probably more about like the way that I grew up and my approach to things previously. So I did my first triathlon was I did outlaw uh, triathlon, which is full distance like iron man and that was even though at uni i wasn't really training as a track like what i'd call training now i was doing a bit of swimming and a bit of running and i was always doing those running but yeah a bit of cycling and so i was just like oh, i want to do an iron man and like, i scoped that one out and did that in probably like 2010 2011 um but it was just a like get round um it wasn't you think uh, i to do an iron man sam or, or were you were you like content like do you think it was a good time? Were you doing it just for enjoyment? Ah, oh, just doing it to get around, just to see if I could do it. I remember lying in, I, we camped the night before, and I remember lying in the tent just thinking, like, how the hell am I supposed to, like, this is in, <laughs> insane. Like, this is like, what am I doing? Like, pre-race nerves, but not not because of performance, just because I'm like, I'm not sure I can get around this. And like that, <laughs> it was that sense of like, I love signing up for challenges that I'm, I genuinely don't know if I can complete. So I've, I've done a few of those in my, like a handful of those in my life. Like I genuinely don't know if I can do this. And that is like, that's, that really like spurs me on to do it. I like, I, and I think that 
that there's been an interesting change as as I've pursued professional triathlon. It's gone from a I don't know if I can complete this to I don't know where I can. It's a different sort of like you're trying to push for performance rather than like we. For example, we did Lands End John O'Groats um, back in 2014, probably 15, um, and we did it in like four days. And we picked four days because we didn't know. I was with a couple of mates, and we were like, "Well, we know we can do it in five days. Like that would be hard, but we know we can do it. Three days is okay. Like that feels impossible. Four days, that's going to be like I'm not genuinely not sure if we can do that. And so we were like that that will do." And because we picked that, we then managed to raise loads of money, which was great because no one else thought we could do it either. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I like that heading into um, heading into something genuinely like not knowing if you're going to be able to like complete it. There's a real risk of like failure, and I think that's I think that's really interesting for that'll be interesting for people listening to this or viewing it. It's like to to kind of have comfort in the fact that someone like you has those have those feelings as well before a race yeah yeah absolutely and like i could take you through so many of the races that i've done um and i i, I haven't done it recently so much but i used to write race reports um like after just because I, I quite like writing so i'd write like quite detailed race reports detailing like my feelings like leading up to it like come i remember coming out of um interestingly although i raced the full distance back in like 2010 i then started to take triathlon seriously only in 20 i think it would have been 2017 really only a few years ago and i raced the outlaw half um and mm. i remember coming out of the water they gave if you if you could show that you could go under four hours 30 then they gave you like a elite start or a gold start okay yeah like that. So you started ahead um and i remember with my gold cap coming out of the water in a much slower swim time i remember swimming and literally feeling embarrassed like i remember swimming like, <laughs> like people from the wave behind that must have started a few minutes after were like catching me i remember swimming like along literally feeling embarrassed thinking people are going to be watching me thinking what the hell is he doing in there like he must have lied about his time or something and I came out and I didn't, <laughs> genuinely, I was like, I had such like, I was like, what am I doing? Got on the bike, felt awful because just do when you first get out of the water. And then actually yeah. ended up having a really, like it was one of the best races I've ever like put together. But, Sam, were you surprised going from, uh, I'm, I'm going to call it normal triathlons to pro triathlons, especially in the swim? Um, I, so a lot of people say it's a shock. For me, I don't think it, I don't think it was necessarily like I, I think it was a good question. I think I swimming, I wasn't ever in control, even in the age group race. I didn't know who was around me. I didn't know where I was in the field. Um, the, I remember my first pro race was Edinburgh, uh, which doesn't uh, Edinburgh 70.3, which isn't around anymore, unfortunately, but I was, um, I was staying with Mark Livesey, who who put us up, and he'd also put up Will Clark. Um, so staying with him, so got to know Will quite well. And Will was just saying, like, just giving me confident boosts, basically, and just saying, like, just go like hard out on the swim, like you've got it, like just I think saying things that I needed to hear, because I was terrified that I was literally just going to be swimming on my own for the whole race because I like I was like I'm in the pro field now there's no like in age group race you just sort of there's there's people everywhere but pro field it's going to be blatantly obvious that I'm a crap swimmer <laughs> and I'm just going to be like off the back and actually there's enough it obviously varies race to race but there was enough diversity in the field that I wasn't at the back in the swim um, and I managed to come out of the water with a couple of other guys and I was just like hanging onto their feet um, through the swim and then once we're out on the roads it didn't I think in age group racing I'd end up off the front on the bike and so I'd be racing solo and then on the run I'd be catching tail end of the pro field maybe and then once you're in lap system it sort of ends up all the same anyway um, in the pro race it just nothing really changed on the swim apart from it was more obvious that like if I saw feet and chase them 
it's more likely that they'll be good feet rather than age group where you can pick some feet and you don't know whether they're going to be like fading or swimming hard or, <laughs> yeah. or whether they're going to like leave you. Whereas in the pro field, nine times out of 10, they're going to be a better swimmer than me. So I can, yeah. as long as I stick to those feet, they're going to drag me along until I can't stay with them any longer. And then mm. you actually get a bit more race dynamics on the bike. And then I generally back myself on the run. So whoever I'm biking with, I'll back myself to like, I mean, there's plenty of quicker runners out there. Don't get me wrong, but generally if I'm with them on the bike, I'll back myself to go head to head with them on the run. And if they outrun me fine, but that's quite a nice feeling to have that if mm. I'm biking with them, they're the one that's got to drop me. Um, and if I can push past them and try and bridge up to the next group up the road, then that's even better. But yeah, I, de I massively prefer pro racing because I've just got that obvious race in front of me rather than like a staggered start and people all over the road. Yeah, <laughs> it's very much like pro racing is you're racing the race, isn't it? Whereas age group racing is kind of like just a, a time trial, literally. Yeah, yeah. And I, I wanted that race. Um, yeah. That, um, yeah it, regardless yeah. of like swim, bike, run, was it a bit of a shock or was it different jumping up from age group to pro stuff because for me i found like i was really worried jumping up to pro stuff because i was like oh my god they're going to take it so seriously they're going to be so intimidating but weirdly this is like my view on it i found that the pros are far more chilled out than the age groupers i don't know if you had the same sort of experience there's a lot of egos in triathlon like don't get me wrong triathlon's a great community and and i love it and i love how there's a certain respect for everyone because it's a tough sport and people commit yeah. a lot to it, but there's so many egos around there. And I think in the age group field, you get it in the pro field as well, but I think there's a lot of people that aren't necessarily, they feel like they need to flash around a bit more to prove yeah. themselves. Um, and I mean, that's sorry. Never, yeah, sorry, Scott. I honestly got told before one race, uh, just get in their heads, like in, in the swim, like, you know, when you all sat down on like the bench in the pool, like yeah. I got told just to get in his head to what to one athlete, like um, like oh just just tell him like he's shit, like tell him you're gonna beat him, like tell him he's got a shit swim and you're an amazing swimmer, like it will get in his head, and like you've just said then, like this lad was barely was barely anybody, like <laughs> I was trying to beat him, like, was barely anybody, and I'm being told to get in his head. I was like, <laughs> like I'm just here to enjoy it, mate, and you've yeah. literally been there, which which you've almost which you've said so well, like Will Clark is such a profound triathlete and he's and he's there helping you on your first triathlon which i think is massive yeah and i think that's actually like will is a great guy like he's helped me a lot um like throughout just yeah um, he's got so much experience but i think that is um that's pretty fair to say for most of the pro certainly the pro men and and the pro women that i do know like pretty much everyone supports you like everyone's pretty supportive like it's mm when you i've made some great friends where we've all just we're staying in the same pre-race like hotel we're we're all racing on the pro like pro start we're um but we're all like actually really good mates like and i get on with everyone really well and everyone's so supportive and even though you're like nailing each other in the heat of battle like in the heat of the race and you're literally you're taking chunks like you're taking prize money away from each other but you still like I genuinely wouldn't like I wouldn't feel any ill towards like any of those guys. I want them to do just as well. And like I love mm -hmm. seeing them do well. Um yeah, it hurts when they run past you or <laughs> or, or they, you just watch them swim into the into the distance. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like yeah, no, there's just been some incredible moments where you're just pushing each other on and, and like genuinely want the best for for most of those guys and they're all pretty supportive. Um yeah, and that actually, that's one of the one of my biggest um, one of the best things that I found about pro racing. I think it makes that, or just just triathlon in general, like taking it like as seriously as I do. Um, I say seriously, like in terms of the training that I put in. Um, yeah, the, the people absolutely make it. Like the sport wouldn't mm. be anywhere without it. Yeah. When did you think? When did you think like I could I could actually start? earning money from this I, i'm gonna actually start taking this seriously and try and pursue it and try and get pro yeah uh it took quite a while i i think 
like growing up i was always like professional sports would be incredible but i never believed um i ne- like i literally thought that's for someone else that i'm never going to be like good enough to do that or that's not something like achievable it's just a dream and it's silly to have that sort of, sort of dream and then i did and i i always thought i like i knew i was i had talent running um like i i could run without doing any training i could sort of win like the school cross country which no offense to anyone at my school was not hard like it wasn't a big school and it was, <laughs> but, but i could win it like and i was i could not over like 1500 meters um or over 5k i was like i easily could could win those races and then go to county and stuff and i'd sort of be like top five maybe um like and do all right but not like there were always people better than me um and so like that's always sort of i thought i knew i I was good but like never like never that never great and then when i was working in london um i'd sort of moved on from university where and at uni i was sort of playing football every day playing a bit of hockey playing like running like going out on bike Uh, and when you start working you just don't have time to do any of that and so triathlon probably pushed its or duathlon pushed its way forward um there because i found i could run to work and back and i could cycle to work and back depending on which office we were in and through that i built consistent fitness because i was doing stuff every day and then i did um i did a qualifier i think um can't remember which one it was one of the like european age group qualifiers somewhere and i won that um and i remember cycling or it was probably on the second run so you run i think it was like a 5k run and then 40k bike or something i can't remember what it was i remember on the second run running <laughs> and claire was out on course and she was looking at me she was like and i was like have i gone the wrong way and she's like no she just like laughed at me and somehow i was like out in the lead and it was it felt awesome like it, it does but i was just a bit surprised like genuinely fully surprised thought i'd like taken a wrong turn or something <laughs> qualified for europeans and then went to spain to race the european age group duathlon champs and um a load of people from work were like oh this is awesome like we'll come and watch so there's like 15 friends from work all flew out to spain to watch and i was like no no it's age group i'm not because you know how it is with age group racing like, yeah people are like oh i'm british champion or whatever it is <laughs> yeah. and i was like no 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 it's not like I'm, this isn't professional i'm just like and i'm probably not going to do very well and then went out there and somehow the same thing like i just ran ran away on the first bit biked all on my own and then just ran and managed to win that and a year later i managed to win the age group it's all age group so like managed to win the world champs over in spain again and it was i think off the back of that i was like well I've, I've got something here because I've managed to, there's a lot of people like racing these that want to mm. do it. Uh, I wasn't under any illusions that I was like suddenly the best amateur in the world because I know there's obviously loads of amateurs that don't, don't, <laughs> don't race the Junapla. I was like this. And, and I think that actually sparked a bit of a pursuit for actually maybe I want to try and get a pro. I want to race in the elite category because then I can actually find out how good I am rather mm. than the age group where there's a bit of a one, if you're winning the age group, like there's sort of a ceiling on that. And, um, yeah, that then pushed me to, I want to race in the elite category. I still didn't think I was going to earn any money from it. And then that's sort of just been a, a cumulative process over. I mean, those races were like 2014, 2015, I then got married 2015. We went traveling, 2016 seven i think it was probably 17 and then it was only when we got back in the summer of 2017 that i then was like i'm gonna get a coach i'm gonna start training like consistently and and that's when i probably started taking it a bit more seriously and thought let's try and like earn some money from this and actually give this a proper bash um hashtag no regrets it was like <laughs> it was a case of do it now because you might not be able to do it in three or four years time um, yeah and so like i i i went for it i i reduced i went to work part-time so i was working like three four days a week but i was working from home which made it so much yeah it made it much more possible just to 
train and work flexibly like i knew how much work i needed to get done i could if i had to ride it like in the winter like at three four o'clock before it got dark then i could just catch up with work in the evening and and mm. same with like sessions in the middle of the day and things like that yeah um, and it also i'm sort of rambling a bit but working from home just means the night before you're not having to pack breakfast for like your after swims eat at work you're not having to make a lunch and then have like a pre like evening session snack and like go into work with like six bags which is sort of what i used to do uh, mm. with like your swim kit <laughs> run kit lunch breakfast pre <laughs> bike like so yeah it was probably around that following the age group stuff i was like i want to push from a pro license and then once i started along that path i was like actually if i could pick up some good sponsors and and a bit of prize and some good results then like some prize money will come and and but you don't do it for the money like you definitely don't mm. try and do it for the money because it's just too hard for that <laughs> yeah um you, you've had some absolutely class support um like 15 lads going out to spain like that seems like an absolute jolly that seems more like a stag dude than a yeah. btu <laughs> um <laughs> but how Good and obviously, obviously i know how much support your missus gives you as well uh, again which is absolutely amazing to see on instagram and how much you promote it as well but what was it like coming back from the crash at the staffs yeah um so that was um beginning of 2019 it was oh, that so I was going, I'd raced, got my pro license in 2018 um, through the result at Weymouth the year before. Um, and then the second result, I managed to win the Outlaw half in Nottingham. So I got my pro license off that, raced Edinburgh. That was still an early season. So I, um, an, a, a, I guess early in my professional career um, as it is. And so I then trained all through the winter, like working my ass off in the swim just to try and make progress so then crashing at staffs like pretty early season in fact i think staffs is about now um i think i'm not sure I yeah think i it think it's, it's, a, it it's about now early june yeah and so it like i cr <laughs> i cried i remember the um i crashed into this fence broke my wrist dislocated my elbow um like came off at about 40 kilometers an hour and the ambulance turned up, they put me on laughing gas. And I remember him asking me some questions and I just remember starting to cry. Oh no. Because I had all this work. It was just, and I, he started tearing up because he was like, I wasn't crying from pain. I was just like, I just invested so much in this, yeah. this winter. And then I just saw it go up in like flames just before it even got going. Um, yeah. And that was so hard. And I, I probably somehow I don't and it must have just been like with support from Claire and people around me within 12 hours I was sort of managing to digest that and I'd seen other people break collarbones and stuff and get back to racing and and I yeah I mean it was tough but I knew that world champs were about 12 weeks away and I qualified the in the prior yeah I think I qualified I'm getting a bit confused now. Do you qualify yeah, no, from qualified, Weymouth, like, wasn't it? Yeah, Weymouth the year before. Yeah. That's it. So I qualified um, the year before in 2018. And um, that... So I sort of made... Prior to um, the crash, I think my goal generally was just to get good, consistent results, build up a bit of a portfolio as such, and so I can go to sponsors and think like, hey, could you support me? I've managed to get these results. That changed with the crash because i knew that i wasn't gonna be able to race for june july um mm. or august really um and so whereas the world champs before had just been a go for a good experience i guess it was still a go for a good experience but it was a bit more of a focus because it was probably going to be one of the only races that i was going to get to do that season um and so i think a big incentive after the crash was just like I cannot go to Nice undercooked. Like if I don't mm. get back to fitness, I'm just going to regret it. And I'm going to be embarrassed because I'm going to, I'm racing in the pro field. Um, there's like, these guys aren't messing about. It's 50 of the best athletes in the world. Yeah. Um, 
like I can't afford to like slack off. So I don't know. I somehow I handled it a lot better than I thought I would, and I managed to get back on the turbo within. A, I gave myself a week of 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 nothing, like just let the body recover from like the trauma sort of side of things, and then I was back on the turbo and just yeah, just doing sessions, um, yeah. easing back in. And I was I was running with cast on, um, and the swim it was frustrating because it's my weakest anyway, and it. it takes the longest to build back up but i man i raced um one of the castle races like a couple of weeks before the world champs just to like get back into it and i i could i felt rusty but it was prom like i managed to win the race and it's obviously a very different field to the world champs field but it gave me a bit of confidence that actually i'm not i've managed to get back a bit of fitness um mm. and yeah. I think seeing your like road to recovery from the crash at Staffs, I, and I was racing that race as well, and I was, it, I remember being on the bike thinking, right, when is Sam going to come past me? Because you always do come past me on the bike. <laughs> so I was just like, just every mile, I was getting further and further, and I was like, when the bloody hell is Sam going to come and overtake me? <laughs> and I remember finishing and thinking, ah, oh, something has definitely gone wrong here. Um, and then watching, like watching your recovery on Instagram, like I know you were, you were posting about the sessions that you're doing and stuff like that. It was like a, a massive inspiration to see that you've, you've worked your ass off. You've been knocked down. You've had this crash, but you've literally just turned around pretty much the same day and gone, all right, well, I'm just going to get back on it and do the same again, pretty much. Yeah. I, I can't really answer like. I mean, thanks for the compliment. Um, <laughs> uh, I I can't really answer that. Like, I don't really know why. I don't know. I'm yeah. I'm I, I'm pretty proud of how like I I don't really say that to be honest. But like, I just somehow was able to process it pretty quickly. Yeah. Like it, I like I said, I I cried in the back of the ambulance. Like yeah. I just couldn't. I, I think it was the laughing gas. Like they said it was meant to have the opposite effect, but. Genuinely, like, they, put, they put me on this laughing gas, and I just started crying. <laughs> but, um, that I just got that out of my system, and by the time we'd driven back to Bristol with a broken <laughs> to the hospital, um, yeah, I sort of managed to process it and was like, "Well, I can't do anything about that now, and mm. it's just time to crack on." Yeah, disappointed. Like it did. It had a bit. It had knock-on effects. Like I didn't. I, but I did have some great racing. Like after the World Champs, we went down to went straight to Davos and raced the following weekend there, which was an incredible race. Like challenged Davos, um, I picked up like a fifth place and some prize money, and then went to Weymouth, which was horrendous conditions, and unfortunately mm-hmm. I punctured like just before the run, which was probably my only puncture that I've had in a race, which is again annoying. But I was racing all right, and then did Barcelona full at the end of the season, but I knew that I wasn't, I needed another winter almost or another like decent block that I didn't have time. I was running out of time to actually get like swim fitness. I hadn't got back up to full run volume, like following the crash. And I could feel those, like I faded in the world champs on the run. Um, just I, like how I wouldn't normally have faded in that way, but I just knew I didn't have the run volume. Yeah same with, with the swim like half i was I was with a group on the in the world champs and then at about probably 11 1200 meters in i just like my arms just started to fatigue and they wouldn't have normally done that in that way uh, yeah so that's frustrating but at the same time i felt so lucky that i was able like it was an incredible experience and i then just sort of tapped the full iron man on the end just to see what it was like knowing that i didn't have the mileage in the legs but just it, I thought it would be a good marker for this season um, with the view to do more full distance racing this season. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> so obviously, like, happened. yeah, th- th- this season's been buggered a little bit by COVID-19. Uh, but what, like, originally, what was the plan for this season? Um, this season, knowing that we, like, we plan to have a baby end of the season, basically, Um which <laughs> basically it was like all or nothing. Like if I can nail this season and get good enough results that I could like basically make it financially viable, um, 
then yeah it was if i can if i can do that prove to myself prove to claire although claire would support me regardless but pr- mm. i think prove to myself that i could make this work um as a as a longer term career um then um then that would be a good result and so i was gonna i was just planning on racing loads like i i perform well through racing i gain fitness through racing i love racing back to back so i had sort of a block of like by now in the season i'd aim to have done like five or six 70.3s and nice i think i was lightening up a full um and then i was going to go back into a group a bunch of 70.3s and then race probably wales and like really focus on trying to get a, a top uh, it, obviously with these races it always depends who turns up but try and podium at wales um that would have been mega yeah it would exactly and whether it would have happened or not i don't know like i don't know if i would have been good enough um i don't know if i'd have performed on the day i don't know who would have turned up but if i could have got some strong results hit a bunch of podiums um performed well at wales then i could have picked up um a decent enough chunk of money to say like yeah this makes up i'm working three days a week this the triathlon has made up the rest of the income um mm. i can i can continue with this um yeah. obviously that hasn't happened and like my priority is always going to be like being a, a dad which i yeah. can't wait for um and so what happens to triathlon going forwards like i can't really answer at the moment i don't really want mm. to answer because i don't want to um i don't want to feel accountable either way i just want yeah. to see see how it goes I think it's literally just see just see how it is and see what see what you can do yeah. basically isn't it Yeah exactly like it's And I think that's sport. like that's I, I that's it, but... the beauty of it it's it's just like the unknown as well you know like sometimes it's nice not to plan things or not almost like not to think about things just let it roll out the way it's going to roll out Yeah yeah absolutely and like there's good things out of this as well like oh, I don't mean that how it sounds like obviously <laughs> covid is horrendous like <laughs> my wife's medical like she works in hospital so she um yeah i i've heard and and i've got a lot of friends that are involved in it so i I know how bad it is there is there are silver like there's good things that are coming out of it and you see like in in sport um i think taking away competition has allowed people to try different things with that the the problem with it's been awesome and it is awesome chasing like high performance in triathlon and trying to be the best you can be over a certain distance but it comes at a cost and like i can't or for Mm. me it comes at a cost because i can't manage all of those plates and one of those is i can't then go bike touring in the middle of the season i can't i can't go on like 24 hour runs or or even just like all day runs like (laughs) two weeks before the world champs claire and i were in um so we'd raced in chantilly uh over mm. done the castle race and then we'd driven down to the alps and were there and i was meant to race in zell because i thought if i do another race before the world champs um that would, that's only going to be a good thing claire and i went for a trail run on the tuesday and destroyed our legs and we were hobbling around <laughs> for the next four days and i couldn't race zell because my legs were absolutely shot we basically ended up running down a ski slope in the middle of summer and it was so <laughs> steep that our quads were wrecked we had to walk downhill backwards like after for the next few days. <laughs> and this was like 10 days before the world champs. And I was like, I've had, like stuff the broken wrist. This is like, this is critical. <laughs> and, oh. and like, but I love being able to do that stuff without them worrying about the knock on yeah. effect of oh, how's this going to affect my training or like, I want to do a big day in the hills without having to worry about so there's there's benefits of that and like definitely trying to make most of that when races are at least like three or four months away yeah 100 percent um so what i thought we might do now is do just 10 quick fire questions not necessarily related to triathlon some of them are a little bit weird but i thought it might just be a bit <laughs> funny for people to for people to listen to <laughs> cool. all right mate so number one is a hot dog a sandwich No. <laughs> I thought the audio just went then I couldn't hear you. <laughs> oh, you said I could think about these things and that one was quite serious thought. All right, hot dog is not a sandwich. <laughs> um 
would you this one's a little bit weird would you rather fight a hundred chicken sized dinosaurs or one dinosaur sized chicken hundred hundred chicken sized dinosaurs you reckon because at least you can make progress I think the <laughs> dinosaur sized chicken you're just not going to win that yeah, fight I guess that's a good point <laughs> Um, okay, do you use this is more triathlon related you miles an hour or kilometres an hour? Kilometres Yeah, cool um, If you had one superpower, what would it be? Uh, I mean, I might regret this but I was talking with Claire today <laughs> Hindsight <laughs> that's, a, that's amazing <laughs> How good Hindsight is a brilliant thing <laughs> easy you could just do whatever you want and if it doesn't work out <laughs> that's so good um i already know the answer to the next one do you prefer cats or dogs, dogs. Yeah. yeah um if there <laughs> this is all right um if there are 30 cows in a field 20 ate chickens how many didn't ah <laughs> have you heard this one none of them ate chicken have you heard of this one before no but I, no. i'll read it I'll, I'll read it out again how many cows 30 I'll, cows and 28 yeah chickens. so i'll read out again listen to the words that are coming out of my mouth if there are 30 i've got mate, i've got you if there are 30 cows in a field 28 chickens how many didn't how many didn't what <laughs> How many? Um, yeah. Scott, do you know the answer? Ah, oh, fuck knows, mate. <laughs> okay. So, are you saying there's 28 chickens and 30 cows? <laughs> no, let me. Let me re- I'll or read it. I'll read it really slowly. <laughs> Ten. If there, yeah, there you go. Who got that? I did. All right, yeah. So I wasn't sure which that was the trick question. So 10 cows didn't eat the chickens. <laughs> Cows don't it's such chicken, a, it's, it's a terrible uh it's a terrible question i got i got another one like that as well um what does y e s spell well the obvious answer is but i'm not gonna Go on, no that. no no it is obvious Y-E-S. yes what does e y e s spell eyes oh that's good see normally people when normally well thick people my girlfriend uh (laughs) (laughs) if i say what is yes spell she go yes what is eyes spell they go yes (laughs) (laughs) all right try try on claire later see what happens (laughs) i I will Um, i look forward to that next question um if i asked your friends or family to describe you using one word what would it be? Ooh. Tough one. I don't know. Tough one. Chilled, yeah. maybe? Nice. Relaxed. I think relaxed. Yeah, I think that's definitely one that would pop to pop to my mind if I if I had to describe you one word. Um if you yeah. <laughs> Auto dickhead. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't going to use that one. <laughs> uh, if you had to choose between either swim, bike, or run for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? And you can't do any of the, the other two. Uh, see, I would have said, I would have said running. Mm-hmm. And then I went on a really nice bike ride the other day. Yeah. And I'm absolutely loving swimming open water at the yeah. moment. It's a tough one, isn't it? Good luck. Could I still surf if I chose not to? I guess that still counts. No. No, (laughs) Uh, I think it would have to be running. Yeah. I I couldn't imagine not running. Yeah. 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 Um, Last question. Do you prefer coffee or tea? Coffee. Yes. Only, yeah. Yeah. The coffee coffee you made this morning was decent. Yeah, <laughs> I need to improve that a bit, I think. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy to test it out. <laughs> I've got 
got my for the listeners i got my jet boil out after our open water <laughs> swim this morning and made a coffee on the side <laughs> i think people are looking I at me a bit weird. it was so good <laughs> i'm weird um, <laughs> that's what this podcast is all about <laughs> <laughs> get right in um yeah, thanks so much for coming on, mate. I really appreciate it. And obviously, yeah, I'm really sorry that um, thanks, audio initially messed up a little bit. <laughs> oh, I'm used to it. I can never get anything to work related to laptop or <laughs> headphones. So. But I, I, Claire bought me these headphones the other day, um, Aftershocks headphones, mm. not sponsored. They are very <laughs> good, though. And then... Um, she told, like, literally, I've been using them for, well, she bought them from about a year ago. I've been using them for a year and then found out they've actually got a microphone in them so I can actually talk to people on them as well. <laughs> found out about two weeks ago. <laughs> Amazing. I was just like, this is... anyway. <laughs> Thanks for having Yeah, me. you're very welcome. And also, for the viewers, um, watch out because Sam and I will be doing, because now restrictions have kind of like eased off a little bit, obviously trying to keep two metres apart. We will be doing more filming together. we got some cool ideas, haven't we, mate? We do. Yeah. Yeah. They're, um, yeah I'm, looking, I'm big time looking forward to those. Yeah. Should be yeah, cool. See what we can Should do. be cool. Um, Sam, one from me. Um, obviously, like, like, Mega, like, thank you for coming on. Um, like, I've got to know you. Uh, like so much through this uh, and how much of a chilled bloke you are, which is class. Um, uh, however, uh, Harry kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, a uh, bit pissed off with you, uh, just a little bit. Um, uh, you've stopped all your Instagram in and you were like my private coach that no one knew about with your Instagram. <laughs> uh, saved me a hundred quid a month. So can you get back? Please? <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry, mate. I need to get back there. It? It's not, like, social media is not my natural, um, not, it's just not, doesn't come naturally to me at all. So I definitely have to, like, work at it. And, like, I have a reminder on my phone that, like, pops up reminding me that I should post something on Instagram. <laughs> but since lockdown's happened, I turned it off because I just can't be bothered. <laughs> but I will get back on it. I will get back on it. Um I'm glad you enjoyed it. Sam, so just to finish off, I think people really appreciated the fact that you did the outro on the last video. <laughs> um, so I'd like you to uh, to do it again for this video, if you don't mind, mate. Absolutely. What's the name of the podcast? Like, What's your official uh, name? Well, Harry we are Harry's... going to... Actually, that's something we're going to talk about. We're going to change the name of the podcast. Um, it's called Harry Palmer okay. Podcast at the minute. But we are going to change the name, but we won't be revealing that just yet. All right. We'll call it the Harry Palmer podcast. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to the Harry Palmer podcast. I have been Sam Pichter. <laughs> this has been Harry. Do you want to say your name, Scott? <laughs> Harry, you have been Harry Palmer. <laughs> Come on, Harry. Thank you. As well as Scott Sharp. Thank you, gents. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you along. Keep training safe, social distancing and looking after yourselves. Um, don't forget to link, subscribe. <laughs> you and love share. saying link. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you're going to link it to. Just link it. <laughs> don't like it. Link it. <laughs> oh, is it, is it like? Yeah, yeah. I don't know where the link come from. I don't know how okay, you've done that again. Like, like, yeah. I think the link I think you'd like copy link or something. I must have said it um, at some point. <laughs> I'm blaming you. Anyway. Anyway, don't forget to like. Yeah, you know what to share, do. Share, subscribe. Cheers, mate. Thanks so much. Cheers, mate. Absolute pleasure. Cheers, boys. Cheers. Good to chat. Cheers. Cheers, Sam. Cool.